great. Um, so, hi, my name is Jenny Berry. I'm the president of the Libertyville Mundelein Historical Society. Um, tonight, we have uh, Dale Eigert with us to do a presentation on the Liverpool Boys Club. Um, a couple of announcements before we get started. This is the last of our spring History Matters. Uh, last last uh, March or last month, we had a program. It was so nice that evening. Um, and now it doesn't feel like spring anymore. So, <laughs> but this is our last spring program. Uh, we will start to get ready for our open house season at the Anselm P. Cook Home. We will be open this uh, summer in June, July, and August on Sundays from two to four. Um, and watch our website for any other uh, opening days. We usually throw in another Saturday or so uh, during the summer as well. Um, our featured exhibit this summer will be uh, some of the quilts from our collection that don't normally get out. So we hope you can come this summer and see that. All right. Um, I will be monitoring the chat and the Q&A uh, during the presentation. Um, if you have a question that makes sense for Dale to answer in the context that he's in, I will interrupt him. Otherwise, we will save all the questions until the end. Um, Dale, if you want to come back on the video, I will introduce you. And there he is. <laughs> All right. Um, Dale and his wife, Mary, reside in Libertyville. Uh, Dale is a lifelong Libertyville resident. He graduated from Libertyville High School in 1974, where he participated in football, wrestling, and baseball. He graduated from Southern Illinois Carbondale in 1978 and wrestled while he was there. He started teaching at Libertyville High School in 1979, mostly health education, but also some driver's ed and a PE. During his teaching career, he was always coaching wrestling. In some years, he coached football, soccer, baseball, and softball. He also served as faculty sponsor for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes for many years. Dale retired from teaching in 2012 after 33 years. But he has continued to coach wrestling for a total of 44 years, 35 years as the head coach. And he's also coached football and is also still sponsoring the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. He is a life member of the Liberal Mundelein Historical Society and has previously presented on History Matters presentations on Liberville High School history and Liberville High School athletic history. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Dale. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. So uh, my interest in the uh, Libertyville Boys Club is I, I was a member of the softball and uh, football programs. When I was doing the, um, the research for the Libertyville Athletic History um, presentation, I came across a lot of Libertyville Boys Club boxing, and I knew that there was a boxing program, but didn't know a whole lot about it. But the more research I did, the more I realized what a great program was and what a great history it has. Uh, had, I should say. So in um, the winter of 1933, there wasn't a whole lot to do around town. Obviously, no one had TVs, no one had video games, of course, and no one really had any money to do anything. So uh, this gentleman, Dudley McNeil, the youth pastor at St. Lawrence Episcopal Church, um, invited boys from his congregation to uh, come to his church um, a couple nights during the week and for various activities, crafts, uh, some physical fitness, basketball was, was mentioned. Um, but within two weeks, there was so much request for um, people outside the congregation to join that he decided he's on to something. He's going to call it the Liberty, Libertyville Boys Club and invite um, all kinds of people uh, to his program. He, uh, oh, I'm not able to, there we go. Um, he put together some of the community leaders, made a Libertyville Boys Club board. Their job was to support the program and come up with various activities. One of their activities was they would, uh, in addition to the, you know, the night crafts and uh, physical fitness, uh, you know, the group would arrange outings for hiking, fishing, um, camping, that kind of thing. And then in 19, the summer of 1934, their second summer, they uh, took a group of boys up to Wisconsin uh, to, to spend a, a two weeks up there. And that became so popular that the Libertyville Boys Club board uh, purchased a, a camp. And for about the next eight years, would uh, send several uh, groups up there. Um, one, one trip up there was not going to be enough to do it. In the summer of 1935, the board had heard about um, a community member, a 30-year-old 
a lawyer was working in the city, uh, Frank Gilmer, and then after work, he would um, stay in the city and coach boxing at what's called what was called the Eli Bates Settlement House. And uh, they had asked him if you would be interested in coming home after work and doing your coaching with the Libertyville Boys Club boxing group that they would like to start. Uh, they would support anything he needed. All he had to do was coach. I think that appealed to him. He was quite the boxer himself. He was a 1927 and 1928 Southeastern Conference boxing champion for the University of Virginia. In 1929, when he was in law school, he was the assistant coach for University of Virginia under his uh, college coach. And then he had three pro fights. He won them all. So he was uh, quite seasoned, uh, quite the guy. Their first team in 1936, uh, there they are. They um, He expected in Eli Bates Settlement House, he was coaching all, all teenagers. So he thought when they put the word out, that's what he was going to get. But as you can see, he was getting uh, all ages and uh, that's good for the future, I guess. So he had a lot of little guys. Anyway, so within a couple of weeks at uh, St. Lawrence Episcopal Church, they realized they did not have enough room. They had 35 to 40 kids each night and uh, uh, Principal Henry Underbrink from Libertyville High School allowed them to come into the Brainerd Gym a couple nights a week and have their practices there. The focus the first year was only on skills and fitness, that kind of thing. But by the end of the season, Coach Gilmer thought these guys were ready for some competition. They went against the Waukegan group, uh, handled them, and then had a meet in, in the city with the Chicago Boys Club, which would turn out to be their longest rival. They went, they went after them every year, um, and they won both their first two matches. By 1937, they were ready to go. Full schedule right from the start. Um, here was an ad that showed up in the Independent Register. Um, always Saturday nights, 8 o'clock if it was home. Always in the Brainerd Gym. And uh, one thing was very obvious quickly, the Libertyville Boys Club boxers were not going to lose very often, if at all. Uh, they were hammering uh, local competition. In order to get some competition, they're making trips down to the city. Here is uh, a typical picture of, of what every picture I've ever seen of Libertyville Boys Club uh, boxing meets was a packed house, uh, 2000 seat uh, capacity, and they would almost always fill it. Uh, there would be some, some uh, examples of people going up on the upper track uh, for some standing room only if, if they had to, not in this picture. Hard to tell in this picture if these guys are really going at it because it's uh, kind of from a distance away. But uh, here's a much better view. You can see that how hard these guys are swinging. And again, um, every picture you got, uh, you, you see of it, there's a full house. Every meet had a program. Uh, the cover of this one is in their second, uh, well, the second year of competition in the fall of 1937-1938 season. And then on the right, the final uh, meet in 1948 when they hosted a group from Toronto. They always had the lineups in there. Uh, here's a Highland Park. Uh, team that they were fighting in, I believe is 1942. What I find pretty interesting is uh, you have a guy right here, George Bach, who happened to be my Libertyville Boys Club football coach many years later in the 60s. And I see where he was, uh, he was a boxer, boxer for Highland Park, as was his brother. And then everybody was involved. Again, there wasn't much to do during the depression. So just about not I shouldn't say every father, but many fathers what wanted to be an assistant coach. Frank was a coach, but they wanted to support him by walking around and encouraging the boxers. And the woman wanted to be involved as well. A woman's auxiliary was set up um, right away. Uh, these three ladies were in charge of it. And their job was to um, promote the fights, to sell the tickets, to collect the tickets, and then to sew the, the robes and the shorts that the boxers would wear. And as Coach Gilmer said, uh, greatest community effort he ever saw because everyone wanted to chip in any, any way with, they could. And all the, the money that the group needed was, was raised by the, by the uh, ticket sales. There wasn't any public money that was used. By the end of the 1937 season, Clarence Zermer was a seventh grader at the time. We're going to see him later on. He stayed with the club all the way through his graduation from high school. At the end of 1937, an undefeated season, uh, they went into the county tournament, dominated with seven champions and uh, five runner-ups. Here's the boxing clubs in the 1930s that, that, that competed in the 1937 county championship. Everyone in Libertyville High School seemed to be involved as well. Principal Underbrink not only was nice enough to allow the boxers to use the Brainerd Gym, but uh, he was always a, 
always a timer. He had he had a gong. He started the rounds. He ended the rounds. Head football coach um, Art Bergstrom. He was involved uh, as one of the judges. Uh, Larry Crawford, the head track coach, was involved. Marvin Wilkins, pictured here on the right, he was the band director, and he always had his band uh, playing before and during, maybe during an intermission and after the competitions. 1938, uh, Jack Brown on the left, receiving his most improved boxer award from the gentleman that was the uh, chairman of the Illinois Boxing Commission at that time. Jack Brown stayed with the program throughout his high school graduation, went into the Marines after uh, after high school graduation, and uh, right away was uh, sent into combat pretty quickly, was in the first wave of Marines that uh, went, went ashore the island of Peleliu, a very brutal battle. Only six of the first wave was able to survive it. Jack was one of those, but he suffered very serious injuries. They were going to allow him to go back to the States, um, leave the service because his injuries were so bad. He said, nope, keep me here. I'm going to, I want to go back in combat, which he did shortly thereafter and uh, lost his life on Iwo Jima. And to my knowledge, my research, he's the only Libertyville boxer that lost his life in World War II, even though plenty of them were sent over into combat. In 1939, they had their first international competition with it when a group from Toronto came into town. In 1940, Virginia uh, came in. Uh, both were boxing colleagues of Coach Gilmer. Um, both uh, they had two um, home and away. So Libertyville went to Toronto twice, went to Virginia twice, and both these clubs came in as well. One serious carryover uh, showed up is that. Um, a lot of the boxing alums became very successful middle distance runners, which should not be a surprise because of the fitness that the boxers needed and the mental toughness that they got. They, they were they received through their training. On the left, you've got Blend Bell, 1940, 440-yard uh, dash all-stater. And then uh, the second picture on the right, you've got the champion 1942 Palatine Relays. Um, mile relay team, which three of the four were uh, were boxing alums on the left, Dick Shields. Um, inside left is Bob Hoskins. And on the far right, you got Clarence Zermer. We see him all grown up now after his 1937 Most Improved Boxing Award. In 1941, Coach Gilmer decided it was time to put his boxing system in, in print. And it was actually his uh, college coach, Johnny LaRoe's boxing system. And uh, Coach LaRoe always would tell his boxers to push him, push yourself. Uh, that was Coach Gilmer's phrase as well. So he decided to name the book that. I got the book from Ruth Beer, longtime uh, Libertyville Mundline Historical Society member. Her husband uh, was in the boxing program and got Coach Gilmer to sign the book. Here are some of the many uh, pictures of the uh, Push Yourself book technique pictures. Uh, just how to counter punch was was one. You've got Dick Shields on the left and Jimmy Nolan on the right. In 1941, the Culver Military Academy, which had a, a long history of boxing dating back to the uh, 1900s, they had a, a team cancel out on them for a Saturday night, and they had heard about this this small boxing club in northern Illinois that no one seemed to be able to beat, so they invited them down. And uh, Libertyville took the train down to Culver Military Academy and put an 8-4 loss on the Culver guys. So as you can imagine, a proud program is going to invite them back two weeks later. And Culver was able to get the win. So it looked like a rivalry was, uh, was in the mix. In 1942, we go, okay, you guys come on up here. I don't know why they usually the, the, the matches were anywhere from 15 to 20 matches, but for whatever reason in, in this um, particular meet in 1942, it was a, a 10 match card and uh, Libertyville beat them eight to two. And the coach was just very gracious and, um, and praising the Libertyville boxing group. He, he made a statement. He goes, they are the finest coach amateur team in America. I've matched my team against college boxers, but they never taken a beating like they got tonight. Also in 1942, the Chicago Boys Club, which we started boxing in 1936, had not beaten us, and it looked like 1942 was their year. After 11 bouts, they had us 9-2 to two with a 9-2 lead, nine matches left, and we won the final nine to beat the Chicago Boys Club 11-9. They would finally beat us in 1946, but again, they had nothing but praise for what a good group this was. In 1943, I'd say the highlight was uh, taking on the Navy Pier team. 
This, this was a group of uh, Navy recruits, anywhere from 19, 20, even some 21 year olds, and they're going against high school kids, uh, but they're not as skilled, they're not as trained as uh, the Libertyville team, and Libertyville was able to beat them. Uh, the interesting um, note, I guess, was the Navy Pier boxing team head coach was Jim McMillan, a 1920 Libertyville athletic legend. He was our best player in the fall of 19 football, uh, 1919 football team. And then he went to the University of Illinois, was an All-American for Illinois, played five years for the Bears. He uh, wrestled when he was in um, Illinois, um, hit three years, was a starting heavyweight for the U of I team and only had one loss. And then was making so much money for um, you know, for professional professional wrestling in the off season of the Chicago Bears season, he decided to give that up for good and had a 20 plus year career in uh, professional wrestling. Here's before one of his, uh, he had two title fights and here's one of them. He's going to take on the strangler, Ed Lewis. And if you look at the two guys, Jim McMillan on the right, you're like, he's, he, he's going to win this thing. But uh, you know, pro wrestling is uh, strangler got him. In 1944, the highlight was Lewis Kick competing in the Golden Gloves, reached the finals, and 40 Libertyville uh, Boys Club boxers got on the train to go down there and support Lewis, who uh, wound up winning the title, our only uh, Golden Gloves champion. And here's a picture right before he's going to go out for his title fight with his, uh, some words of encouragement from his father. Now, by the time the war was over, or when the war was over, the numbers started dwindling, and the independent register was constantly putting out appeals for more boxers. You look at what the team record was for uh, 1936 through 1946, and uh, that is nothing short of amazing, especially when we're traveling to try to get some competition. The, the final record after the 1948 season was, was a nice record, but when you consider the last two years, that is very un-Libertyville Boys Club boxing-like. So the numbers were dwindling, but there were two guys you didn't have to you didn't have to motivate to get out there. Bob Matthews and Bill Widener, both from the class of 1949, they were undefeated in 1946 and 1947. They both took a loss in 1948, but that was at a national tournament in Virginia where um, both lost the finalists. Bob Matthews, before he lost to the finalists, had uh, knocked off the Southeastern Regional Champion. A uh, great picture here of Coach Gilmer giving some mid-round tips to Bob Matthews. 1948, uh, like I say, was the final year of the program, uh, but they had some, some great excitement. Uh, you can see them up on the track. That's a pretty good picture of some standing room only. In 1947, a TV station, WBKB, asked Coach Gilmer if he would bring some boxers down to the station in, in Chicago. He wanted to film them sparring and see if, uh, if, if boxing would work on uh, the network of, of TV. He brought some boxers down, they sparred, they uh, tele or not televised them, but filmed them and then thought, you know what, That's, that will work. We're gonna get into the boxing business. But then in 1948, Coach Gilmer goes, hey, how about returning the favor? How about if you televise our final home match of the, of the season? They said, if you can put up a hundred foot tower, um, we will, we'll, we'll come down and do it. So they, the board always had a real nice board supporting the program. They were able to put the, tower up and uh, sure enough they had a, a a great picture and during the during the the meet they were they were telling people the viewers they were saying write us in during the week you know no email at the time but write us during the week here's your address let us know how the how the picture came through they were getting notes all over northern illinois southern wisconsin northern indiana even into michigan were saying that the picture came in clearly so for the 1949 season, Coach Gilmer got WBKB to agree to televise all of their home meets. They had a nice schedule set up. They're even going to take their first trip to Pittsburgh for 1949. But when uh, 1949 rolled around, uh, Libertyville Boys Club Boxing did not answer the bell. There were less than five boys that showed up for the first practice. The board thought we just don't have a, a, enough people to um, have a program. And Coach Gilmer agreed. I mean, he, was, he, want, he wants to coach a team. When asked right away, what do you think the problem was? And he said it was the post-war prosperity. People got TV, uh, TVs, they got cars, they've got spending monies for movies. And his claim, possibly get kids to stick to a vigorous training schedule. I can imagine uh, knowing Coach Gilmer what that was probably like. 
His next paragraph, he says uh, he agrees that Libertyville Boys Club softball and eventually football were reaching more kids than boxing did. But he, uh, you can see he's not completely happy because he says body contact sports of boxing and wrestling have never been so important to our youth today. I got a feeling he would not like what he's seeing this day and age if he thought back in the 40s they had easy living too much. Uh, some post-club thoughts. Uh, this Chicago Daily News writer was talking about the quality of fighting done by the Libertyville Boys Club Boxing. They had such a great reputation throughout the Chicago area. Uh, he made a statement in his article that no known injury to any boy. I mean, they had some bloody noses, of course, but no broken bones, no, no surgeries. Um, any boy could participate. They, were, they raised plenty of money through their 2000 uh, seating, you know, uh, standing room only, that kind of thing. They made plenty of money through that. Um, one key theme that kept running through all their, their meets was um, the sportsmanship that they would show. Everybody that went against them acknowledged what great sports Libertyville Boys Club boxers were. Uh, Coach Gilmer insisted on, the, as soon as the fight was over, go over and congratulate your opponent, congratulate the, the coaches. And uh, people really enjoyed, even if they were taking losses, uh, the production that fighting a Libertyville Boys Club boxing team was. This board member at the bottom uh, says, yeah, he thought that people kind of took it for granted that Libertyville was just playing good, even though it was such a, a small you know, town at the time and not really a long history. They got good quick. And obviously, a lot of credit goes to Coach Kilmer and all the community support. Here's a Libertyville Boys Club softball that did begin in 48. Maybe they had something to do with why uh, they were losing interest in boxing. But this is from the Rockland School Playground. If we have any viewers that uh, were in the Libertyville Softball League at Rockland School, this will look very familiar. Brian Envold is on the mound for the Cardinals. I'm playing third base. I got this picture from Joe Nemers, a longtime Libertyville community member. Libertyville Boys Club football unofficially started in 1948, where some of the fathers would uh, take some boys from their area and play boys from another area. And in, informal, they would they would ref it themselves. But then by 1940, uh, 1951, they are up and running. They had their own board. And as you can see, it's, even though this is 1957, they uh, they got many board members right away. The, the key leader was John Snow. He's in the first row. Uh, he is holding the, the, the football, this is 1957 on it, but um, for anyone who's in boys club football from way back when, you know the original four teams, I'll go in clockwise of how they practice at uh, the Highland School playground, but you've got the Hornets, you got the Yanks, Demons, and Eagles. This is an example of, or this game on the left is from the, uh, what they call the Instructional League or the Pee Wees from the, they played Saturday morning on the Highland School field and then the JVs and the varsity would play on the high school field later on. Now the Libertyville Boys Club's got their own nice field, the, the football program, the, the softball program has ended probably in the mid 70s, but the football program is as strong as ever. The most successful Libertyville Boys Club boxer was Truman Sturdivant. He started as an eight-year-old in 1942, and he had to be nine, but they could tell by looking at Truman that he was very mature for an eight-year-old and very athletic. So he stayed with the program you know, through 1948 when it ended. As he was a freshman in 1949, he played football in the far left. He played basketball in the center and then ran track on the right. In 1950, he transferred to Wayland Academy in Wisconsin, which had a boxing team. He resurrected his boxing career. Can't really tell you how he did then, but he did well enough that he wound up going to University of Wisconsin and boxed for the University of Wisconsin team. And in 1956, um, Truman's in the NCAA finals, and here he is on the left in the white going in the finals, going against his Arkansas opponent, Billy Ray Smith. Some of you might recognize that name. He was a longtime defensive lineman for the Baltimore Colts, and he had a six foot and 35 pound advantage, but uh, Truman outlasted him and uh, won in um, uh, two to one, won, won the third round where he kind of wore him down. Here's a picture of Truman fighting. And uh, another person might be on tonight, Bill Yope was a member of the boxing program as well. And he boxed for the University of, or from Colorado Mines, the School of Colorado Mines, I guess you'd call it. And when he would come home in the winter, Truman's looking for, um, for someone to box with, someone to spar with. And Bill would get the call despite being, you know, probably about 30 pounds lighter. That couldn't have been a whole lot of fun. So what does Coach Gilmer do when he is um, 
doesn't have a, a boxing team to coach anymore. Well, he had gotten into officiating. He was doing Golden Gloves officiating in 1930, started in 1938. Then he got his NCAA license in 1939. He got his pro license in 1941, but he was never really the, he, he was never the head official. He would uh, take some fights and, and be an assistant judge. But then when the boxing program was done, he said, I'm getting into it full time. He became one of the most sought after uh, officials in the area. He got five title fights. And then right here, he is um, officiating Joe Lewis's comeback against Cesar, Cesar Brion. And on the, left, on the right, you can see him declaring Joe Lewis the winner. In 1956, Governor William Stratton uh, asked um, Coach Gilmer if he would be interested in being the State Athletic Commission chairman, which his responsibility is to sanction the the fighters and or license the fighters and sanction the fights. Whenever he would show up for a fight, he would wear this, this, this badge on the right. He did that for five years. And then he decided um, at that time, let's say he'd be 56 years old at the time. He decided it's time to devote, you know, his time to full-time into his law career. So um, he did no longer officiated, no longer uh, was the state uh, athletic commission chairman, but his first thing in retirement was to write a, uh, his second book on how to judge boxing. It's not how to be a boxing official. It's how to how should you view boxing uh, from the standpoint of boxing had not a very good reputation at the time. And he's saying that's certainly it's not the there, there were some swindlers in the business, not the majority and definitely not in Illinois, because he's that was his claim to fame while he was a state uh, commission chairman. So for the next 13 years, he didn't hear anything about, you know, Coach Gilmer with his boxing, heavily involved in his law career. But in 1974, by that time, all the ex-boxers are, um, you know, heavily into their career and families and pillars in our community. They decided it was time to honor their, their longtime coach with a tribute banquet. Uh, here's some of the guys. You got Dick Shields. We've already seen him in that Push Yourself book and one of our middle distance runners we talked about. Uh, Bill Widener Sr. was a board member. There's his his son, who was one of the undefeated boxers from 1946-1947, uh, Blend Bell, one of the early boxers, who was also the All-State Mill distance runner, and then Jimmy Nolan was also in the uh, Push Yourself boxing book for um, demonstrating the techniques. And uh, Bob Matthews, one of the most successful boxers, had this to say, just great things about um, Coach Gilmer and how he's, you know, all he's done, he's probably the most underrated in individual in the community. So uh, Coach Gilmer in 1978, he, he retired and he was going to go back to Virginia, he thought the warmer weather would, would be uh, good for his health. He actually wound up only living there for about six months before he passed away of a heart attack at age 71. Uh, here's Coach Gilmer with his wife, Gloria, his uh, daughter, Gloria, at the time growing up, she went by Sue, obviously, because of the mom being Gloria, but here is Gloria now as an adult, she is a music professional. Um, in Alabama, as well as a music teacher, and very helpful in this presentation. All, many of the pictures and the information that I got came from her. And here's uh, Frank's son, Walker. Uh, Walker was a longtime English professor at uh, DePaul University, and nothing that I'd seen in the, in the things that Gloria had, had given me had said that he, he was a boxer. He didn't show up in any of the starting lineups, so I, I didn't know that he was. Well, anyway, so I found out he was, uh, my mom was in the class, Libertyville High School class of 1949, and I'm going through her stuff, and I saw an article written by a gentleman named Bruce Stark, who also was an English professor. He was talking about growing up in Libertyville um, in the 30s and 40s, and he said that his dad wanted to make him tough. So he, he, he took him over to the boxing thing and he goes, I hated it. I wasn't very good. And there was only one guy that hated it worse than me. And that was Walker Gilmer, the son of the coach. And then he goes, isn't it interesting how the two worst guys in the program turn out to be English professors. I hope we don't have any English professors listening. I thought that was interesting. Uh, me and my brothers, my brothers and I, we were all very interested in boys club. I don't recall. Uh, I'm in the center in the softball picture. I'm the right uh, for the Yanks, of course, in the football picture. I don't recall ever being dragged to a practice. I, I know that's something I was all in for, but it really didn't matter because our father was the boys club commissioner, uh, five years of softball, seven years of football, and uh, quite involved in coaching when he even wasn't the commissioner. So the question is, would I have gotten involved in boxing uh, growing up if they had it? And I'm pretty confident that that um, 
I would have been, I'm sure my father would have been all, he was in favor of my brothers and I getting involved in wrestling. He enjoyed that, even though he's a basketball player growing up. He went to the same church as Coach Gilmer. I saw them on several occasions talking and he had ab absolute admiration for Coach Gilmer. What I didn't realize was this picture on the right is uh, after he passed away, I'm going through his stuff and I found this picture and uh, that's him on, uh, on the right-hand side throwing a haymaker on his uh, Northern, 1951 Northern Illinois fraternity intramural meet. And I saw from the caption that he lost. So that's probably why he never told me about, uh, about his competition. Here's a list of all the boxers that I, from all the programs I had, uh, Gloria had given me most of them. Uh, these are the guys in the starting lineup throughout all the years. Now, there were plenty more, I'm sure, that were in the program, just didn't make the starting lineup. And sometimes they would have matches where Libertyville would box Libertyville, but they, they didn't make the program. But uh, probably a lot of familiar names. I'll keep this here for a bit so you can see if your favorite boxer, grandparent, or even parents on here. Dale, this is Jenny. It, While people are looking at that, maybe we can answer a couple of questions uh, that have yeah. come up. Yeah, good call. Uh, uh, who or uh, how was a win or loss determined by a takedown or criteria in a timed period with judges? Very good question. Okay, so Frank went big time, and I I forgot to mention that. So they had you you saw from the picture they had an elevated ring. Um, they got that right away. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to the question. They actually got the firemen to assemble it for every home meet. They didn't have it for practices and they would take it down at the end. Frank got um, state commission certified officials that would come out for, for every meet. He had uh, one main judge and he would have two assistant judges that were there. And they would go three rounds. For the older guys, they would go three three-minute periods. For the, the young kids, they would go three one-minute periods. And then just like they would do now, you would win periods. Um, first period, this guy won. Second period, this guy won. They don't really tell you at the time because in the third period, maybe the guy that lost two periods could knock the other guy out. So if a guy gets knocked down, they get the 10 count. They don't answer the bell, and uh, they would wind up losing. Okay, I think that you answered this question as well. Um, where and who did the boxing referees for LBC matches come from? Yeah, they were they were state commission certified. Uh, they were always from the city. Coach Gilmer had so many friends from the city involved in boxing, and he would bring them on up. Okay, there's a couple other questions, but I think you can continue. Those seem to fit in here well. Okay. okay. So here are your board members, and I've mentioned whether they're an original Libertyville Boys Club board member, not necessarily original for boxing. Then for the B, you got if they're original for boxing, and then if they had a board president tenure. Now they've had, they still have a board years later. I only did the ones during the, the 1933 through 1948. Uh, this one here, Aura Newsom, anyone who attended Libertyville High School and is familiar with athletics has heard of the Newsom Award. Um, he wasn't a coach for Libertyville. He was a community member, but he was involved in just about everything, including boxing, you name it. He was always the homecoming parade chairman. So um, I think that's why I decided to name it after him. All right. So when my, my dad took over as commissioner, he was given a lot of equipment, including a box of Libertyville Boys Club's uh, boxing uh, stuff. And um, it, by the time he was a commissioner, that was like the mid-60s. And that had been nearly 20 years since the program had ended. So the boxing stuff wasn't used, but, you know, they figured if you're the commissioner, you got to hang on to it. And uh, me and my brothers, we found all the gloves and, you know, the shorts really weren't worth a thing because they're elastic. You lost that. I probably would have worn those around. There, there weren't any robes, not sure why, but plenty of gloves and me, not, not really me and my brothers, because we probably would have killed each other. They would have killed me. They were older, but me and my friends, we used up the boxing gloves. So all that's remaining now from the Libertyville Boys Club boxing are these, this, this pair of gloves. And then the gong that Principal Underbrink would use to start the round and end the round. That is the end of the presentation. So I'll be interested in some questions if you have any more. Yeah, we have a couple others here. Um, I noticed the gear got more colorful with LHS logos over time. With the crowds and TV exposure, did this become a moneymaker beyond ticket sales like for sponsors or advertising for the Boys Club? You know, I think they were only interested in paying their bills. 
I don't know that they did anything. They had that camp that ended in 1942, and they were probably, you know, supporting that camp for a while. But then when the camp ended, um, I don't know, 2,000 people, a uh, home meet. I, you know what? I, I'm sure what they spent it on was travel, you know, going out to Virginia. Um, they, they took Bob Matthews and um, um, uh, Bill Widener, and I'm trying to think of the other gentleman, but they took one other gentleman out to that national tournament. So I'm sure um, they didn't make any money, but they paid their bills. All right, we have, um, surprisingly, the LBA, um, the Liberal Boys Club disappeared in 1948, right before boxing on TV, Friday Night Fight became popular in the early 1950s. Uh, your thoughts on that? Well, I, like I say, I know Coach Kilmer wanted to keep it going. I know the board wanted to keep it going. Uh, I think his explanation probably made some sense. Um, you know, and, and most of the boxers, Frank, Frank Kilmer was saying that um, people were kind of using boxing to, to escape, like, in, you know, before Libertyville got into boxing, they were using boxing to escape mean circumstances. Well, in the 1930s, kind of everyone was in mean circumstances, not everyone, but a lot of people. And then all of a sudden there's no mean circumstances around here. So it kind of lost its interest. But in Chicago, you still got plenty of people down there that were uh, escaping, you know, what he would call mean circumstances. So that's my only thought. And if you ever watch those Friday night fights, I'm sure Coach Gilmer, if he wasn't the head official, was probably one of the uh, assistant officials behind the table judging the rounds. Um, and the other question here, which I'll ask, and then I'll make a comment on before you um, okay. reply. Um, it says, did Liberal Boys Club, have, did Ken Lovell, I think the question is, did Ken Lovell participate in the Liberal Boys Club or any relative of our Lake Forest astronaut? Um, just to say, there was a Lovell family in Libertyville, and Jim Lovell, the astronaut, lives in Lake Forest. There's no known connection between the two families that we've, we've not researched that, but I don't believe that they're related. Go ahead, Jim. <laughs> Jenny, if you don't know that answer, <laughs> then we, we don't know. Because I, I know you up, know who the, the yeah. Jim Lovell is not originally from Lake Forest. So. Right. And I, I, I know you're very familiar with the Lovell family, the drugstore and everything like that. So I, I, I wouldn't know. I mean, I did see that Miss, a Mrs. Lovell was on the auxiliary. Um, that yep. would have probably could have been Ken Lovell's wife that would have been the next generation after frank and augusta who owned the level drugstore the mrs level in the 30s was likely not augusta level i can't remember exactly when she died it was sometime in the 30s but frank level had passed away in like 1910 um, okay so i think that's gladys level but i can't okay. believe this you wouldn't happen today but every time they they meant i i let the, the first names off because it wasn't the woman's first name it was the man's first oh, name right yeah. mrs phillips Philip Elstrom, and I'm like, uh, okay, but I'm pretty sure it's Gladys Lovell, who was a teacher at Libertyville for a year or two, and then um, I'm not sure what she got into, but she was on the board for like numerous years, like probably 20 years. I think she's a long-serving board member, so I would say she was probably married to the to the son of the drugstore owner. Yeah, she was. She, I'm pretty sure she was married to Ken. I'd have to double check that, but I'm pretty sure that's the connection. And then it was Sun Ken that was the Libertyville Boys Club County Champion, 1937. Okay. Um, is there? I had the same question that, that I'm going to ask. Is there any known footage of any of the fights? I would love to see that TV broadcast. Well, first of all, WBKB is no longer around. Um, no, I mean, I you would know better than me with the Historical Society. I'm kind of new to this actually, but uh, other than the boxing gloves, but I don't think so. But I can say they, they, they actually, they, they, they'd only televised that, that one fight. And so I don't know. Go ahead. Yeah, I can say for sure that the historical society does not have any footage. Um, whether mm -hmm. somebody has it, uh, I mean, the place I, that comes to mind to maybe check is um, I think there's a broadcast museum in Chicago. I mean, oh. I'm just thinking of, I'm trying to think of Chicago institutions that might have it, but the short answer is, we don't know of any. Right. <laughs> Could there be some yeah. out there? Sure. <laughs> um, let's see. Do you think there's an opportunity to resurrect boxing? Why or why not does it have a future? Okay, so um, 
they actually made two attempts at resurrection of the program in the 1950s. Coach Gilmer was not involved, but some of the fathers of some of the boxers tried and it, they didn't last through the year. So my hunch is now that um, there is so much wrestling going on for young kids as well as high school kids. I don't, I don't really see it. I know that um, the sports complex had, had, a, had a boxer that was training some kids over there. I also know that Jim Mellon, uh, a Libertyville High School graduate from 1967, he ran a, a boxing club called the Wounded Deer uh, throughout the 90s. And, and they would box in the city a little bit, but they never really had the numbers. I think it was just Jim Mellon's passion to train boxers. So I don't, I don't, I, on a large scale, no. I know the boys club boxing will not get involved because they're not going to compete with all the youth wrestling and basketball that's going on. Okay, another question come in uh, regarding the uh, full houses at the Brainerd building. Um, when the Blackhawks played at the old Chicago stadium in 1950, 1960, they exceeded the capacity of the stadium, but the fire department didn't shut them down because the Tribune only published the capacity in their paper. Comments about the LBC attendance in the Brainerd building. You know what? I, I, I'm wondering if they, well, okay, they had standing room only up on the track. We saw that one picture against a club from Toronto where they were up there. I got to believe the fire department was all in favor of them doing it, seeing how they were setting up the ring and taking it down. Um, There's only 2,000 seats for 2,000 people. Maybe they cut off the ticket sales at 2,000. I can't really speak for it. I didn't really, other than you could always count on a packed house. That's about all I can really say. Uh, we have, hello, Lewis Kick was my wife's father. What year was he a Golden Gloves champion? Where were the fight, where was the championship fight held? You know, that I don't know. I could, it, maybe if I researched that a little bit, it was 1944 that Lewis Kick uh, won the title. And I want to say the Chicago Amphitheater kind of rings a bell. It could have been Navy Pier, but there wouldn't have been much seating there. Uh, I had been in the old Navy Pier, which is not Navy Pier, you know, tourist attraction like it is now. It was just a big old barn where they did training, um, you know, routines. And then there's a lot of shipping going on on the, on, on the dock. So I can't believe it would have been there. I'm, I'm going to say the auditorium, but that, that's, that's a guess. And the reason why I say the auditorium is where the Chicago Bears um, played one of their NFL championship games in the 30s where the, the, the snow was so bad uh, that they had to go inside, made up an 80-yard field. So I got to believe that was big enough for the Golden Gloves. And if anyone knows, uh, please hit the chat room and let us know where the Golden Gloves was held back in the 30s and 40s. Uh, was boxing in Chicago held at the old Marigold Arena used for wrestling? I'm not familiar with Chicago boxing, honestly. I can't help on that one. I would say they both have rings. You're talking about professional wrestling, I'm sure. Uh, so very well might have. All right. Those are all the questions that were in the Q&A. Oh, here comes another one. <laughs> uh, I thought regarding film of the boxing, my granddad had lots of fun movies back then. I can see if there are any boxing. I know other sports are represented. That would be great, uh, Todd. I'm actually gonna um, put the Historical Society's email address in the chat. Um, so if anybody has further information, um, you can email info at libertyvillehistory.org. Um, and that would, if anybody has anything at home, you just never know what you'll find in boxes, as Dale can attest to. That's for sure. Uh, great to see my dad's photo, Tony Basso, uh, coach of Yanks football team, shared many memories. Uh, my mom also supported Boys Club. Tony Basso was the coach of the Yanks. Well, the original, he was the original Yanks coach, and he is in that 1957 picture. Yes. Um, what was the name of the TV station again? I would love to do some of my own research to try and find some footage. Yeah, WBKB. WBKB. All right, do we have any other questions for Dale? Oh, okay, this one says really neat presentation. Getting a feel for the times was super. Thank you.
Okay, well, while you may be thinking of a last question, I'll just kind of um, give some wrap up uh, email. So um, as those who joined us at the beginning, you know, we were uh, recording. Um, so within a couple of days, this will be posted on the Historical Society's YouTube page. Uh, I pasted the link to the YouTube channel. And you guys can't see me. Now that I'm actually talking about my stuff, I'll get on. <laughs> um, I'll, uh, I posted the link to the YouTube channel in the chat. Um, everyone who signed up for today, whether they attended or not, will also get that link once it's posted. So uh, watch your inboxes in a couple of days, um, if not sooner. Um, I'll get it up there for you. Uh, I also just wanted to remind you again that the Anselby Cookhouse will be opening up again in June. Um, I put the link to the information about that in the chat. Um, as well as um, if you enjoy these um, programs, these are all supported by the Liberal Wonderland Historical Society. We would love to have you join our society. Um, our membership year starts June 1st. I put the uh, link to our membership information also into the chat. So uh, take a look at that and we'd love to have you join us. So are there further questions for Dale? Okay, I think that's a sufficient pause. Um, so thank you again, Dale, for your wonderful presentation this evening. Uh, thank you to everybody for joining us. Um, and uh, we will see you back in the fall. Watch our uh, webpage uh, and the library's newsletter and events calendar for our fall programs. Thanks so much, everybody, and have a great night.